Sometimes when my wife is out of town and nobody else is around, I'll be out here late at night in the shop, working away at the computer, and I can't help myself. I've got to stop and compile Chromium just to see how fast I can do it. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And I've been daily driving a 3970X 32-core 64-thread Threadripper since they were new about three years ago. It was a big leap for me because I was coming from the i7-4770K, I believe it was, and that was my next computer after that, and I've had it ever since, and I'm still using it today. But as fast as it is, I'd trade it all for something a little faster. And so I was interested in the new Threadrippers that I heard were coming out. And so I reached out to one of the biggest tech channels out there to say, uh, you know, help a little guy out. You got a contact at AMD that I could maybe reach out to. And their response was basically, it was hard for me. It should be hard for you, kid. Kind of like an old programmer. Anyway, so I wound up reaching out to AMD who connected me with HP. And HP has sent me to evaluate one of their awesome HP Z6 G5A workstations. Now... It's not mine to keep, but it has to go back at some point. No money changed hands. They have no input on the editorial side, and they don't get to see this before I publish it. Now, the Threadripper is equipped with the NVIDIA RTX 4080 as well, so you would think I would do my video editing on it, but I actually do all that on a Mac Ultra Studio because I'm a fan of Final Cut, and I'm kind of bound to the software, and so I, I run a Mac for that. But the machine would be very capable. I, however, use it mostly for software development. And so what matters to me is compile times, particularly on large software projects. I had started out with compiling the Linux kernel, something I did in my last episode. If you missed that, check it out. But at some point, even that's not enough code because I think it takes less than a minute on this machine. What I would really love to compile is the Windows NT code base from uh, the source leak for server 2000 or 2003, I think it is, because I left in that era, so... I remember what it was like and that it took overnight to build and I'm curious to see how long it would take to compile that. But I'm not going to mess with leaked source code. So what could I compile that is huge and will really evaluate the CPU's ability to build massively in parallel? And I figured the Chromium source base is a good candidate, plus it's pretty well known as a benchmark. The benchmark standards that I've seen I've put the 3970X up near the top. And I'm probably the 3990X is a little faster, but I haven't found a number. Either way, they're running about 30 to 34 minutes in that range. So I figure if we can shave a few minutes off that, which we should be able to, then at least we've got something. Now I'll walk you through the Chromium build setup process and the actual build in a moment. But first we need to talk about what I'm going to do next, which is to upgrade the memory in the machine. Why am I doing that? Because on my initial builds, I found that with 192 copies of LLVM, the C language compiler running in parallel, it was demanding upwards of 200 gigabytes of combined memory and swap. And I only had 128 gigabytes of actual RAM in this machine. I can't believe I'm saying only 128 gigabytes, but such is life with a massively parallel machine. So I thought right off the bat, I'm gonna upgrade the memory in the machine so that it's not constrained by RAM and that way it's actually building and not paging to disk. That way we can get a fair number. So let's take a look at the HP workstation and the RAM upgrade. All right, we've got eight sticks of 48 gigabytes each of Micron DDR5 ECC 5600 RDIMMs at 1.1 volts and CL46. One of my favorite things about these HP workstations is the toolless design. I simply grab the tab and pull the handle down. Similarly, on each side, we have the PCI slot covers and fans that force feed your PCI cards. One on each side here. There's the GPU. And if we go to the center, we pop this tab and this tab and the whole thing, whoop, wrong way, this way, Dave. Whole thing should lift out. There we go. The Threadripper Pro supports eight channels of memory and we see eight DIMMs already installed. That's what's giving me my current 128 gigabytes. So we'll simply pop the sticks out and set them all aside one by one. And that's the problem with replacing RAM in a machine that was already fully populated. But at least now my workbench sports 128 gigabytes of RAM. And the empty RAM packages mean that I've installed all eight sticks and it should be ready to go as soon as we put everything back together. So let's put the CPU cooler shroud back on first. It should just snap back into place. And then I can put on the two PCI fan rail systems here. That one will snap in quickly and so should the other one. There we go. And with that, we've got the machine back together. 
Finding that RAM was no easy feat. There's no documentation yet on this machine, and there's nothing on their website in terms of a vendor compatibility list for memory. So I posted to the Hardware Junkies forum on Facebook, and Kai posted back with actual part numbers for me to try out. And so I went to, wait for it, Walmart. Why Walmart? Well, because Bass Pro Shops was out of memory that day. No, because it was the only place that I could find 5600 mega transfer RDIMs in ECC for server memory, the general specific category memory that this machine requires. Plus, I needed eight sticks, and so I wanted to end up between 384 and 512 gigabytes of RAM in that range. And so it worked out well because these were 48 gigabyte sticks, as you saw. So after placing my order on Walmart.com, I had my RAM in two or three days. So back when I found the machine was paging madly and I was slowing down the build so badly, my initial reaction was to limit the number of threads that it would do in parallel to 128 instead of 192. Now you'd think, well, it's only going to run two-thirds as fast, but that's not true, and I'll explain that in a moment. First of all, it saved a lot of time because by limiting it to 128 copies of LLVM, the compiler running at the same time, I was able to stay within the memory constraints of the system and stay under the 128 gigabytes of RAM, and so it wasn't paging at all. So that allowed it to run CPU bound. Now, I wasn't running all 192 cores, I was only running 128. So as I said, shouldn't it be two-thirds as fast as possible? Well, yes and no. It would be, but here's kind of the thing. This is an OEM system, which means that it's limited to the limits built into the CPU. The CPU, however, is overclockable, but not on an OEM system. So what that means is that this system is limited to 350 watts of power. And when you're running 128 cores, it's already pulling 350 watts. So adding more cores doesn't really buy you that much more ability to do work. Now, there are other benefits to having more cores, but in this case, at these power limits, I was constrained by power and not by the number of cores. Still, the proof is in the pudding, and the only way to do it is to let it run unconstrained at 384 gigabytes and see how it builds. So from there, let's go take a look at how to set up the Chromium build environment and what it takes to build it and how fast it can do it. So the first thing I'm going to do is to install NeoFetch so I can get some information about the CPU. We'll let that run for a second, and then when it's done, I will go through and I'll do a sudo apt update and a sudo apt upgrade in order to make sure my system is up to date before installing all the tools we need to build Chromium. After that, I like to install the build essentials package, which tends to include most of the things that you need to build, hence the name. Though I see it turns out to be build essential, not essentials. So we'll install that, let that run for a minute, and take over from there. Next, you have to make sure that you have curl, git, and Python 3 all installed on your system. Looks like I already do for each of these, but it's good to check before you start trying to build things. Next, we need to clone the depot tools, and I'll put all this in the video description or a link to it. And once we've got the depot tools, we need to edit our path by adding the depot tools to our path. I'm going to create a directory called Chromium, then I'm going to change into that directory, then I'm going to run fetch in order to pull down all the code. I'm going to run no hook and I'm going to add no history, which will save me a lot of time from downloading an entire source history for all of these files. The build instructions say this could take up to 30 minutes on a fast connection and significantly longer on a slow machine or a slow connection. It took three minutes in real time, so I found that pretty promising. Next, we change directories into the source folder and run a script that will in turn pull down all the build dependencies that this project needs to build, which is a rather extensive list. So as you can imagine, I will fast forward through some of this. And once that is complete, we run gclient run hooks, which now I'm no Linux wizard, but I believe that will run all the post install processes that it needs to do once all your packages are actually downloaded and installed. Now it looks like they have a tool GN here that will generate basically make files for everything that goes on below here. I believe that's what's going on, and it looks like it takes a few seconds to do that, and it made 18,811 targets from about 3,600 files, and it did it in two seconds. Pretty fancy. And I wanted to run NeoFetch to take a look at the CPU, so let's do that now. And we can see it's correctly identified as an HP Z6 G5A workstation. And that has 192 threads at a base clock of 2.5. I've never seen it get that low. And that it has an NVIDIA RTX A4000 and 386 megabytes, I guess they would call it, of memory. And finally, to kick off an actual build, we run their Auto Ninja tool with an output folder, tell it we're building Chrome, and we're going to add time to the beginning so we get our actual performance metrics at the end. 
And I'm going to run a session of HTOP, my favorite Linux utility, on top of so we can monitor the build process, see how the CPU and memory is being activated and used, and what processes are actually actively consuming resources. A little HTOP trivia for you. Since I wrote Task Manager, I thought it'd be kind of cool to get a hold of the guy that wrote HTOP. So I tracked him down in, I believe it is Porto Alegre, Brazil. His name is Hisham, and he seemed pretty cool. We talked Task Manager and HTOP for a while and had kind of an interesting set of conversations. Now I'm running the video of this process at 2000% speed. And it's kind of neat because we can watch the graphs as they go over time and see which processes go as large trends. Obviously, CLang++ is the big, not culprit, it's the big tool being used here. And we're saturated at 100% almost all the time. You can see we have 192 running tasks on average and a load average of about 196, 197 up in that area. And as you can see when it wraps up, this build took 19 minutes and 27 seconds. Pretty impressive given the 30 to 34 minutes I've seen online for fast builds, but I think we can get a little faster yet. Now before we go through the benchmark results, I should tell you up front that at first I was running everything under Hyper-V. So I was running Ubuntu as a Hyper-V VM underneath Windows. And it's actually not underneath Windows because when you install the hypervisor with Windows, it's actually kind of running under Windows too. And so Windows is sort of a special peer, but Ubuntu is basically running on the hardware, but through the hypervisor. But in order to rule out the possibility that I was going to blame this all on Hyper-V and Windows, so I installed a new drive, installed Ubuntu on that, booted to that bare, and then ran all the benchmarks again. So it'll be interesting to compare the Hyper-V to the bare metal results. So under Hyper-V, my best result was limiting it to 128 cores with 128 gigabytes of RAM. So in the 128 gigabyte config under Hyper-V with about 110 gigabytes allocated to the Ubuntu VM, my best result was 18 minutes and 25 seconds. I then installed the 384 gigabytes of RAM, unleashed it to 192 cores, ran it again and came in at 19 minutes and five seconds, somewhat slower. Not a huge amount, but enough that I noticed it on the benchmark because it's 30 seconds. So I thought maybe it was something magical about running at 128 cores. So I ran it again at 128 cores, but with all 384 gigabytes of RAM. And it was slower, 20 minutes and one second. This is when I got concerned and thought I got to get Hyper-V out of the equation here because for all I know, it's not giving memory in the same NUMA nodes or something. And turns out I, my concerns were not justified because when I installed raw Linux on the bare metal, what I found was a best time with 128 gigabytes and 128 threads of 18 minutes and 20 seconds. Five seconds faster than under Hyper-V, which I would consider to be noise. So equivalent, which I think is actually really impressive and it's reassuring that if you're going to run something under Hyper-V that you're not paying a huge performance penalty. At least I didn't find that you were. Now again, that 18 minute and 20 second best result was with the original 128 gigabytes. Once I installed 384 gigabytes, my result, still limited to 128 threads, was 19 minutes and 40 seconds. So about an additional minute and 20 seconds. And the only thing that really changed was more memory. When I uncorked it and finally let it run 192 threads with 384 gigabytes, it came in at 19 minutes and 27 seconds. That's still a full minute slower than the original 128 thread, 128 gigabyte config. So how can that be? Well, I don't rightly know. Looking at the CL timings and all that, they're all identical between the RAMs. They're all 4,600. I will try to put the part numbers for the RAM that I installed in the video description so that if you're a super knowledgeable person, you can take a look and perhaps post a theory as to why the machine is slower. Now, I went from eight sticks of one size of memory to eight sticks of another size of memory with all the timings that I believe to be the same. Should not place any additional load on the memory controller, but these are 2R rank DIMMs. So perhaps more voltage is required through the controller and that may affect timing. I just, that's a little above my pay grade in terms of hardware. So I look forward to your comments to speculate on why this machine actually got slower. You might then wonder, what did I wind up doing? Well, I returned the memory, or at least I just filled out an RMA with Walmart and I've got a really compliment Walmart. The return process, even though this was through a third party vendor on Walmart was seamless, painless, quick, and uh, they provide the shipping label and everything else. So the FedEx is coming on Monday to pick it up and I will happily purchase from Walmart again. Kind of an Amazon guy, but it's nice to know they're out there if they have it in stock. If you found today's compiler adventure interesting, please uh, consider subscribing to the channel. Even though it doesn't make a lot of difference in whether or not you see the videos, it's kind of the metric by which I judge my success. 
I'm not selling anything, and I don't have any Patreons. I'm just in it for the subs and likes, so I would appreciate it if you left me one of each before you left today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.